This is L&D Unlocked, a series for L&D and HR professionals looking to unlock the future of learning and development. Presented by Biz Library, L&D Unlocked is an ongoing series where we speak to industry experts and thought leaders about the future of work, workplace trends, and how your organization can prepare today for the challenges of tomorrow. Learn more at bizlibrary.com. Welcome to another edition of L&D Unlock, the one and only series for L&D and HR professionals looking to unlock the future of learning and development. You can find and subscribe to this series on our YouTube channel at Biz Library. Very, very excited to introduce this week's guest, Kim Lear, who is a researcher who specializes in looking at generational differences in the workforce. Kim is a well-known keynote speaker on this topic, and Kim also shares my extreme passion for behavioral science really understanding you know, why human beings act the way that they do, what makes them tick, and really what I've learned from getting to know her, all of the background of things that happen in our childhood that are absolutely the reason <laughs> that we are the way we are today. So, um, Kim, welcome. And if you could please um, just spend a little time telling us a little bit more about yourself, and I'd love to hear kind of how you came to find a passion for generational trends. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so, I'll give you just like the super short snippet of how I got interested in this topic, which is that um, when I was a sophomore in college, I read uh, uh, Jean Swangey's book on millennials. And it's one of those weird serendipitous things where I can't remember if I like stumbled upon it at a bookstore and bought it, or if it was Mm -hmm. like one of those weird books that my parents had around the house. And like during winter break, I got bored or something. But Jean Swain, she's a great researcher, a great social psychologist out of UC San Diego. And this book that she wrote, you know, 20 years ago on millennials, it was about my cohort. It was about like the backdrop of my formative years. And it's, uh, I found it so interesting. And she, she's older than me. She's not my age, but the way that she, um, just encapsulated so much of my youth, the way that technology had, you know, had ended up shaping so much of uh, my views, my interactions, things like that. And then I went back uh, junior year and it was my junior year of college. That was this big tipping point year in technology. And so it was the year, it was 2007 and Thomas Friedman has written about this. Other writers have written about the technologies that were released in 2007 that were immediately adopted by young people. And I was on, I was on college campuses there that year. That was me. And so I became, I was so aware of the ways in which these new technologies were impacting just my little, little sphere. And uh, that made me interested in the topic overall. I went on to stay with that, to study that. Amazing mentors, David Stillman and Lynn Lancaster, Deborah Arbett. And uh, that's that's what I've always done. I developed like an obsession very young and then I never stopped doing it. <laughs> that's <laughs> cool. It's cool to know your thing too. Like that's such yeah. a neat niche. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, 20 years later now, I feel extremely old to be like one of uh, fellow millennial one of the first people that ever had access to Facebook on a college campus. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And it was, I mean, we just, all of those little moments that feel so nostalgic now, but at the time it was, you know, the waking up the morning after a big college party and making sure you weren't tagged in something stupid and that kind of thing. And it's, <laughs> it's it doesn't feel consequential in the moment, but then, 20 years of reflection and you really begin to understand the way that a lot of different things, but those types of technologies just wove themselves into the youth culture of the era and how that continues to shape, you know, consumer trends and behavioral patterns and the way we're influenced, the way that we influence each other, that type of thing. I love that. Yeah. And we'll get into that a little bit um, here shortly around, you know, technology specifically and how everyone experiences technology different and kind of that speed of change is is just exponentially more than it is each new generation, um, which is fascinating to me. Uh, so I want to start um, first with just talking about kind of engagement and culture. You know, you look at kind of our audience and people watching this um, episode, it's 
you know, really a challenge for HR and L&D right now. How do we get an engaged team? How are we connecting people to the culture? Uh, and I'm curious your perspective specifically on work from home and kind of the return to work battle um, that's yeah. occurring. You know, I, I, I'm I going to over over generalize, but like, you know, you, I think you generally see um, older generations of leadership, the C-suite thinking work needs to get done in the office. And then you've got kind of these younger generations of workers that, you know, for Gen Z, I, I manage many of them. Hey, I've never been in an office, so why would I go back? I, this is normal work for me now. Um, and they say they never want to go back. But am I overgeneralizing that? How do you kind of view how generations are impacting the state of that work from home return to work battle? It's so complicated because there is no comprehensive data set that can be like everyone born between this state and this state wants to do this in the return to work like that that doesn't exist and so always with this topic we want to be uh, you know sensitive to over generalities that just can create more misunderstanding um, and it is complicated I mean when with a huge segment of more senior workers you know one of the, it's these little things as soon as we don't think about even in our focus groups and interview series, we have a ton of seasoned leaders who definitely want to work remote. And sometimes it's things like their spouse is already retired. And so they do still want that ability to like be engaged. They like their work. Um, perhaps they do need that income stream, whatever that is. But they also want to have some flexibility to do a little bit more travel or to spend a little bit more time visiting kids and grandkids and that kind of thing. So it's, you know, we we definitely see that component as well. And then same, not, and I don't like doing like myth busting because I <laughs> think it's annoying. But just to give like another perspective here is we actually see so many young workers wanting an in-person work experience. We have, in, I mean, in, in hundreds of interviews with young people who launched into the workplace last May. Okay, so you know, they're it's like their first year in the workplace, turning down jobs that were remote. And again, there's these like personal things that we consider with this that sometimes are not always top of mind in a workplace setting, but statistically, people are less likely today to marry their high school sweetheart or their college sweetheart. And so a lot of young people are single and a workplace is an environment where people meet other people. And, you know, so there, there's that, that type of so thing. So common, yeah. Yes, exactly. And then, and also, and, you know, Harvard University, University of Iowa, and the Federal Reserve, they did come out with a, it's a, it's a working paper. So again, not conclusive, but the early data is very compelling, showing that for older workers, for more seasoned workers, remote work is better for their productivity. They've already built up reputational capital, social capital. They know what they're doing. They don't always need those connections. And so at home, they can just produce that can be their sole responsibility. Young, younger workers, remote work has not been as good for them. Like meaningful mentorship and, uh, you know, real sponsorship, uh, this, a, a lot of growth and development, it just has not translated perfectly to doing it online. And so leaders are in a very tough position where I do talk to some leaders and they have to balance they, like, they may have to sacrifice some seasoned worker productivity for the sake of younger worker growth. Because even in the interviews with young people who are really hungry to have an in-person work experience, they specifically want to be there to be around more seasoned people. Like they don't want to come in there and have like a clubhouse of peers. It's the blind leading the blind. And they know that. Like they want to be with people who where they can really learn from. So I think it's more about how we really leverage that in-person time, right? Like the the in-person work experience, it can't be like 2019 where it was, you know, suboptimal and it was all of these meetings that could have been emails and windowless conference rooms and people, you know, just sitting in their cubicles, filling out Excel spreadsheets by themselves. Like, it, you know, there's components of work that can be done from home. And I think every generation would really benefit from. And then it's how do we properly leverage that in-person time so that these connections, this culture building, this growth and development can happen organically. I love that. A uh, couple of funny anecdotes. I was presenting 
couple of weeks ago and we were talking about this challenge of, you know, hybrid and, and remote work and um, two funny points of feedback. One person said they've been working remotely for 20 years and they're glad everyone else finally caught up. Um, but she also mentioned when she first went remote, her boss literally said, you know, this is career suicide, right? Like you're not going to, you're just not going to have exposure, right? And there's that proximity bias of if you're not around, you're not in person, nobody knows you're there, what you're doing, um, yeah. which I think is a, is a common challenge. That's yeah, for sure. And, and the one other piece that I just want to bring up about that, like the idea of older workers really being the ones to prefer the in-person work experience. I think something worth mentioning just for that context building is that when we look at like retirement trends today, we already find that for older men, it's mostly baby boomer men who are on that, who have retired or on the precipice of retiring. There are cultural reasons for this, but we do often find that there is this, you know, who you are as a person and what you do for a living are inextricably tied. And again, for other cultural reasons, many, not all, but many men of that generation, their close connections and their, um, you know, interpersonal connections were built inside of some type of infrastructure. So the workplace, um, you know, for older baby boomers, perhaps that was the military, you know, and so outside of an infrastructure, there are not a lot of social, of, of close social ties. And so it, it is one of the reasons why we see in certain sectors, some of the older workers, if it's a predominantly male environment, that there is that preference to work in person. And I think the common thing is like, they don't trust anyone. They think that if workers are at home, no one's working. Uh -huh. I think there is like an, an, another piece of this that, that, that they would not even say, but I think there is another piece of this that has to do with you spend 45 years in a physical work environment. You dedicate everything to that work environment. That is where your entire uh, you know, social connection is. And so the idea of working from home, some of that you know, loneliness or isolation that can happen with that um, feels like untenable. So I think that's another just person, you know, human piece. It's the nature of who you are. That. Yeah, it's what. Yeah. It's what you know. I uh, I was the same way when COVID hit. I'm like, I, I refuse to believe that in 20 years, I'm going to tell my child that there were these things called offices and you went in and yeah. worked next to people. Totally. And now it's not that crazy to me, right? But that all is just the, the time shift. And as time passes, you get used to something. Um, it's insane. But it, it's funny, you know, you're, you're making me think about generational differences and these misnomers or these assumptions about people. Um, our CEO started our company 27 years ago, pre-COVID, 99% in person in St. Louis, post-COVID, about 70% remote. And none of us go in that are in St. Louis. We're, we're fully remote. Um, and he's like, he, he, you would think, similar to kind of what you're talking about, he'd be someone who's like, no, like I, productivity is in the office. It's what I believe. And he's really evolved on that. And he's like, hey, you know what? I realized I was the original remote employee. You know, he spends half his time, uh, one part that wasn't St. Louis, Michigan, then half his time in Florida. So he's like, how can I, you know, expect people to come in if I was the original one? So you're seeing a shift in kind of understanding of that as well as as people are kind of getting used to it. Totally. Absolutely. I think as and and as the technology gets better, I think that's a piece, too. So we're already seeing advancements. And I think as remote work can get a little bit more immersive, we get more comfortable with it. All of that. It can change. Uh, you know, it'll be an evolving conversation. Um, so along that line, but I'm I'm fascinated, you know, I've managed a lot of Gen Z, or Gen Z population, you know, like right out of college, 23 to 25, the ones that I've managed. And, you know, it's funny now that we're all remote, it's, it's great uh, because the, the talent pool is a lot bigger. But what I found a couple of times is people saying, the, you know, right out of college, oh, I love remote work. I'm totally good with it. Like I'm, I'm used to it. That, that's what college was or whatever it is. And then about six months to a year in, they're like, no, I'm taking a local job, like an agency or something. Kind of to your point, like that in-person was important to them because they understand how it's going to shape their future. Um, so I, I'm curious your perspective. Um, and you presented at our, our Align conference a few weeks ago. And I loved your perspective on Generation Z's interest in what you called optimization. And how does that impact work? Um, and if you could share, I absolutely loved, it really stuck with me your vending machine story from one of your focus groups recently. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in the presentation that I did for 
biz library, I talked about one of the events and conditions shaping Gen Z was growing up with this, uh, this backdrop where we as a culture were abandoning our obsession with convenience and replacing it with an obsession on optimization. And the terminology difference is convenience is about involving little trouble or effort and to make something optimal is to make it as perfect, as useful, as effective as possible. And so one of the examples that I give around just some of that you know, technological backdrop is I show an image where there's a stationary at-home bike and then there's a Peloton. Um, and I, of course, ask people to ignore Peloton's recent stock price. But looking at how you know a traditional stationary at-home bike sold consumers convenience. It was friction-free. You didn't have to drive to the gym and wait for the machine that you wanted. But the reason that Peloton could be so disruptive in an already crowded market is because it didn't sell consumers convenience. It sold them optimization. It collected data about your speed and your strength, your goals, and push notifications to your watch and your phone, not just helping you exercise, but to actually help you advance. And so that's just one of a million different examples of optimized technology and then I just talk about how that backdrop and how being accustomed to that environment impacts work. And the story that um, that Paul is, is alluding to is that one of the research projects that my team and I did is we followed a group of young people who went into the in-person work experience for the first time. And they had to do one or two years of university online and a virtual internship. And so one of the guys that was part of this study, he like super smart, tier one school, very ambitious young guy. And during the pandemic, he really had to figure out how to optimize his own time, how to use his time more perfectly, more usefully, more effectively. So throughout the pandemic, when we were you know tracking him and, and he was part of the study, like he would figure out the best times to do deep creative work, the best times to answer emails, the best time to work out, the best time to uh, you know exercise, best time to eat, all of these things. And so because he wanted to still perform at a very high level at school and because he had a virtual internship, he just, you know, what are the technologies that need to be leveraged in order for me to do this in the most effective, perfect, useful way? How do I organize my time? That type of thing. He went into the in-person work experience for the first time in June of 2021 and we called him a few weeks into it to do the follow-up interview and ask him how it's going. And he, the story that he told us is that he went to go put money in the vending machine at work and the wrong chips came out. And he was like, that was it. That was the last <laughs> straw. And the I, first remember, and last. I remember listening to this being like, that is such a weird hill to die on. But when I put it into just this broader framework of this, um, you know, optimization of using your time, leveraging technology in a way that is more perfect, more useful, more effective, coming into the in-person work environment, everything felt suboptimal. Um, so it wasn't just about like the vending machine and the chips. It was just, that was one of so many things that felt like a step backwards to him. And so I think that trend, it's permeated other generations. I'm sure some of you are, you know, watching right now being like, yep, yeah, that would be me. Like that's, so it, yeah. I specifically talk about that trend because it has this like upward effect on other generations. But I would say that I do find with the younger workers that there is a exceptionally low tolerance to this suboptimal use of time to suboptimal work experiences because, in, you know, in a lot of ways, to no fault of their own, they were kind of forced into the situation of fending for themselves in, in some ways and figuring out how to use their time, use their technology in a way that was more perfect, more useful, more effective. Hey, I'll connect that um, to kind of a question for you, because there are perceptions from, I think, older generations that younger generations don't appreciate hard work and um, you know, it's interesting now the the mental health push makes yeah. it so that, you know, anyone can kind of take time off and work isn't supposed to be fun and work isn't supposed to be easy. You know, you got a, kind of a shift in in generational views on what work is. And I, I can't help but think what you're talking about around optimization is closely connected to kind of those generational differences, too. Do, would you say that's fair? 
Yeah. I mean, we could talk all day about like generational perceptions of sacrifice and work ethic and time even, you know, all all of those types of things. But I think that something that is helpful when you approach this topic of generations in what I would consider to be like the right way is that you're meant to view these things with a real spirit of curiosity instead of judgment. Like it's always easy to look at the norms of a new era and be like, they've got it wrong and we've got it right. (laughs) But there's also a way to view it to say like, I wonder how this came to be. So, you know, I mean, an example of like, you know, we talk about mental health at work, well-being at work. We talk about this reevaluation of this question of what am I willing to sacrifice for work? And if you put yourself into you know, if you try to view the world through the eyes of another generation, you see young people stepping into the workplace for the first time. And I think there's many things happening. Two of them are that with properly leveraged technology, there really is a different pace to how work can get done. I mean, I think about, I do work in like the legal field. You think about the legal field, billable hours, right? So many of those billable hours would go to the research that was required on a lot of these, um, you know, legal issues. And there would be a like 25 year old right out of law school person. And they would be spending an exorbitant amount of time figuring out like what cases were comparable and how did that end and all that. Mm You can put the question into a large language model and what would have been two weeks of research is now about 45 seconds in a lot. So I, you know, we don't have to go down that whole path, but like, no, I love it does it. change the way that we think about, um, you know, focusing more on what gets done and obsessing less about how it gets done, which can be a really difficult thing. And then I think the other thing that's impacting it is you've got young people coming up and they, you know, they they look at the precedent that that has been set. You know, if you look at baby boomers, about half are divorced, about two thirds have one or more chronic illnesses. Um, I know today that young women, there's a lot of reevaluation around kind of that like girl boss feminism of the millennial era and that type of thing. And so it shouldn't be a huge surprise that you have young people coming in and they're just they're trying to figure out for themselves what role is work supposed to play in my life? And like, what am I willing to bend on? What am I willing to sacrifice for my job and my career? Yeah, you made me think, I mean, staying on the technology kind of side of things. Um, I w- um, recent PricewaterhouseCoopers survey of uh, C-suite executives, the one of the biggest things they're concerned about in the next three to five years is um essentially, is our business model going to be obsolete, right? Like, are we in trouble because of the rapid pace of change? And it makes me think your story example of that's a good thing that it takes 45 minutes to do the same work that was done in two weeks. It's a scary thing for profitability. And what? Are, how are we going to build? We still got to make the same amount of money. And you've just made it so that we don't have an excuse not to do it quicker. Or someone else out there is going to have a different business model that gets the same results much quicker. Uh, so what's kind of your your take on generative AI? You talked about large language models, but AI's impact on generations, because it was interesting, you know, you've shared that I didn't realize, I think baby boomers buy the Apple Watch more than anyone else, um, mm-hmm. which, you know, again, is something that would surprise you and you wouldn't realize. But how do you see, you know, who do you see being left in the dust by generative AI? Will, will boomers actually be early adopters, right? What What are you seeing early on and what's your take on that? Um, I'll make sure if there's like notes to this that I can provide the academic research, um, that there is as of right now, um, a like generational gap in intentional AI usage. I use the word intentional because we're all using AI constantly. (laughs) Um, it's in like Google maps, you know, whatever you're using, it, it has some components of AI, but intentional, like I'm seeking it out is that as you can, as maybe this does align with the stereotype, but Gen Z is using it substantially more than um, other generations, definitely a a lot more than baby boomers. And so, you know, I think that there's, uh, at this point, most of us are in agreement that um, a human's ability to like leverage what 
these like large large language models specifically can do is imperative just for like future relevancy, future marketability. And I would even say just not to be Pollyanna about it, but I think there is a lot of promise in like that human and AI collaboration when it comes to the creation of truly novel and innovative ideas. And so I think there are good things about it, but it we people do across the board. I think the more that you experiment with it, the faster you realize what it could be leveraged for. And I think there is going to be the sweet spot in the marketplace for people who are really good translators of that, you know, for, because the stuff that's coming out right now, if you put something into chat GPT for, it's like some of it's not right. Um, you know, they can, they're prone to like hallucinations and some of these other things. And so you need to be able to decipher that, but I think there's a lot of promise, but just like with so many new technologies that come out, the people who end up having an early advantage are the ones who experiment with it earlier and faster so that they can better understand the best ways that it could actually be used. Yeah, it was uh, interesting. I, um, some of the data I've looked at that's fascinating is, you know, I think the people who survive and do well are going to have a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And and naturally, younger generations have that growth mindset because they came up with it and um, saw something, a recent survey of high school seniors. And it was like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And 30 percent of them said creators. And, you know, yeah. our generation was like a lawyer or a banker or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. That's just how their brains think. And so um, you could be scared of that or or not. But I also saw that, like, by 2030, the roles that will be the percent of work that will be taken is much more of like repeatable data type roles, office clerks and customer service and some of those things. But what it means, and I, I say this to a lot of HR, like HR people generally like, I want to be in strategic HR. I don't want to just put out fires all day. Okay. You're going to have opportunities to actually prove that. And that should be an exciting opportunity for you to actually be a creator, a strategist, much more of like a high, high level, adding the human aspect of strategic thinking and collaboration the yeah. people who are successful will actually embrace that versus, you know, not. But I, for sure. And I think that we already see so many examples of that across the generations, but it is almost this exercise in being like, um, I just like did a project for a large association of architects, right? And you think about how much architecture has been disrupted by generative AI. And so even for them though, it's like the role of an architect may no longer be to like you know draw up the blueprints and things like that but what they do that as of right now like ai cannot really do is think through in the most like human empathetic way like what is the human experience of this building like you walk in that i mean still ai is not great at figuring out like the daylight uh you know it things within a building. Um, you know, architects work in different communities and some of them that I work with, they work in some of these lower income communities, communities with more, with a larger population of marginalized people. And they really think through like, what could this specific community center and the design of it, the placement of it, like, what can it do for this community? And so it is just a little bit of that retooling of like, just like you said with HR people, right? If your job is no longer to like put out fires and review contracts and, you know, things that like AI can probably do, then it you do get to move into a place that leverages more of that human side, which I think is such a strength of HR people anyways. It should be more fulfilling. Yeah, ultimately. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so this is a great time for a short break to hear from our sponsor, Biz Library, on how we are the one-stop shop for l and and are truly where learning happens for your compliance, upskilling, and leadership needs. At Biz Library, we know that employee development and retention have never been more critical to your business. We help you build learning programs that create safe and inclusive work environments, elevate employee skills, and develop leaders who drive results. So now, you can take award-winning Biz Library content and put it to work to help overcome your biggest challenges. Biz Library, where learning happens. Okay. 
Okay, and we're back. So, Kim, you alluded to this earlier, but I'm I'm fascinated by it. A lot of things going on in the L&D space right now are heavily focused on skills, upskilling, reskilling. We talked about the pace of change and how the the skills needed every year are kind of growing exponentially, and that's a struggle for L&D teams to keep up. I'm curious uh, if you have a perspective on what considerations do we need to have when thinking about upskilling a very diverse workforce? So, a lot of challenges I think people are having are like, how do you personalize learning for different generations who all experience learning very differently? Um, and kind of curious your perspective. I know you spoke to kind of being empath- empathetic to different types of people's experience, but uh, any other thoughts there? Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay, great. Um some of this is almost a reminder of like L&D 101. So I'm sure many of you who are watching, you know this, but like we've, the, the more like immersive and exciting that any type of learning can be, uh, the more impactful it is. And again, almost back to that optimization piece is like we already find that some of the traditional ways of getting people that information um, you know, when it does feel almost more like an HR checklist instead of this like experience, it's just harder to get people to participate and then really hard to get them to actually like engage in the work in a meaningful way. Um, but I love that you brought up like the growth mindset piece. I think with so much of this, you know, there's the really specific skills. There's the specific reskilling of like, this is what, these are the skills that your job did need. These are the very specific skills that your job will need. And so we'll train on those tactics. But then I think there is just a lot of room for the development of kind of that can-do spirit within an organization. And that can be infused into L&D in so many different ways. Um, You know, there's one organization I worked with where part of what they did before getting into like a more practical training is um, this the the leader of this group, and I think they brought in an outside consultant for this. Um, they just had the small group talk about um, like a time in the work environment where someone you did kind of fall, you got back up again, you taught yourself how to do it. And almost just those reminders of like, you can always learn new things. And as better ways to work come out, like you you can adapt to those. So I think that that's kind of an interesting part of the L&D space right now. The other, and one of the things that we talked about briefly during the presentation is those communication skills and like really honing in on the development of those, especially as we bridge this COVID gap. Because one of the things that we did find is that there's a little bit of a delay in some of these traditional adult style communication skills. Um, <laughs> and it's not, I mean, there, and the, we can, we don't have to get into it right now. There's a lot of reasons actually, even besides the pandemic that that could be, but we're already seeing large organizations. I mean, there was a big Wall Street Journal piece on KPMG and Deloitte and a few other companies who are putting quite a bit of money into like helping the newest employees to enter the workforce, be able to put their ideas in the right wrapping paper because, you know, good ideas and good people, they fall through the cracks constantly if their ideas are not in the right wrapping paper. And so it's these learning opportunities about how to properly vet ideas, like how to bring an idea from like ideation to execution, how to get people on your side. Um, You know, so it's those little things that I think can make a big difference because once people get some of those wins, then that's the competence and confidence building that you really need in a new generation of of leaders. I I love that. It's interesting you say that. Um, Something we just started doing with our sales development representatives who are, you know, much newer, uh, generally uh, just out of college, you know, majority of them was we're remote. They don't get exposure to other people. And like they they don't get the casual collisions in the office. They might have an idea where they run into someone or meet someone from another department can go ask them. What I don't think is happening from that communication lens is, you know, my generation, anyone who's been in, a, in an office for some time understands now remotely, oh, OK, I just got to call this person and share that thought or that idea. That's very foreign if you've only ever worked remote. Um, so you almost have to, as leaders, force those conversations. So one thing we're going to start doing is 
twice a month, call someone from a different department and have a conversation with them, which is crazy. But you would have done that every day in an office and you just can't now. But you have to actually set a, set aside time for those communication channels to exist. For sure. And, and you know, one of the organizations that I worked with, they had um, something that some of their leaders would do is like after a uh, like remote meeting, they would just say like, hey, Paul, can you like stay after for five minutes? I just like wanted to chat with you for a minute. So everyone would get off and it would be like a leader with, you know, a, a new employee. And they would just be like, hey, you know, I haven't really gotten a chance to like chat with you or meet you. Like, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. But part of the reason for that, like, hey, can you stay five minutes is because it's the spot, like the whole water cooler conversation and the magic of it, whatever you can believe in it or not. But it was the spontaneity. Like that was the whole point of it. And so you couldn't have premeditated answers. You couldn't come into it with an agenda. It forced you into those situations where you just had to respond to someone in real time. And with this organization, that was the area that they were seeing specifically their salespeople having the hardest time with, where in a sales scenario, you have to react constantly. You constantly have to be like, you know, being able to listen to the information, come up with something to to say that works, that resonates. And so that was one of the things that the leaders started doing was creating moments of serendipitous, spontaneous conversation in a remote environment. I, I love that. What else I what else I love that I thought you might have were gonna go here. That can you stay after five minutes? You know, I think about like school is uh right. ooh, they're in trouble, but like Owning that as no, this is actually built in time for unstructured conversation and getting to know each other. It flips what could be a negative on its head, especially when you think about, um, you know, there's so much less access to leaders in organizations, especially cross functionally. So being able to open up those lines of communication and and kind of build that psychological safety in that way is really cool. Yes. Yeah. Love that. Um, hey. Along this line, um, and only two two more questions for you. Um, you talked about, I really like the phrase you've used, like emotional regulation as a really important leadership trait. It's fascinating to me, and you kind of mentioned this with organizations starting to truly like train on those skills of, um, you know, emotional regulation as an example. How do you feel millennials and Gen Z are kind of prepared to move into management and can you kind of connect that to, to emotional regulation and maybe what, like, how prepared or, uh, different generations are with with that? Yeah, I mean, the the way that I set up that piece on emotional regulation is talking about millennials pouring into the workforce in the early 2000s, which was the whole era of authenticity, like that whole era of bring your whole self to work. And uh, so many good things about that. And there's a lot of reasons for why that happened in the early 2000s, which I won't go into right now. But as millennials moved into leadership roles, when I interview managers 29 to 39 years old who directly manage five or more people, one of the questions in those interviews is, what have you found surprisingly difficult about managing? And a lot of the responses do have something to do with like finding that line between friend and friendly and being part of the team, but still being in charge of the team. And I think that that's kind of connected to authenticity, which if for your most of your professional life, if the training and the focus, even if it was subconscious, was very much on like, bring your whole self into work. And like, it's good to have this authenticity. And it is, but I think we do already find that you know, being strategic about which version of yourself you bring into different uh, into different parts of the workplace, that's like a strategic leadership move. And we already see the the millennials, you know, the, the oldest is like 42, right? But the ones who have these faster career trajectories who are leading larger teams are the ones who are exhibiting more of that emotional regulation where the daily stresses of the organization or of life don't have such a role in their day-to-day -day communication and attitude. 
And so I feel like I already see a bit of a pendulum swing, not away from authenticity, but into this place of like, um, you know, finding that line. And I'll, I mean, I, I can give you a personal example here, which is I was young when I started managing, um, managing other people. And I think probably just what would be authentic to me is like kind of people pleasing <laughs> and I want people to think I'm nice, you know, and that type of thing. And so one of the things that when I was a young manager and managing people either my age or just a, a little bit younger than me was I was really effusive in my feedback. And so someone would turn something into me and I would be so quick to be like, I love it. <laughs> Amazing. You know, I would use some of that hyperbolic language, like that type of thing. And I, I had a wonderful manager and she just said to me, like, when someone hands something into you, just like take a beat, just say like, thank you. I'll get back to you tomorrow with feedback because she really encouraged me to think about like, what is it that they need from you as a leader, not as a friend. And as uh, you're like, you're kind of serving this role as like cheerleader and, and, you know, like you've got it. And that's like a good friend role. But as a leader, your job is to make them better. And so if everything that is turned down is meant is met with like hyperbolic language and effusive feedback, then their bar is lower because you are easy to please in, in the workplace, you know? And so um, she cut, she really encouraged me to be like, just wait even. And that was so unnatural to me. That was so like inauthentic to me to be like, okay, thanks. Like I'll get back to you later. But then I would come back with really meaningful feedback and the dynamic shifted where like I, my role was not as just like cheerleader, you got it. I really tried to shift my role at that time to like, my core job is actually to like make you better. And, and see the things in you that you don't see in yourself to pull out some of that potential. And I think that is just one of a lot of examples about how you kind of shift from in the team to like responsible for the team. Love that. Hey, closing a uh, very serious question for you. Are you, um, I have got to think uh, in the world of Taylor Swift and between the Eras tour and dating Travis Kelsey and all the things, I don't know if you've followed like the, the mix of NFL and Taylor Swift, just her raising the NFL's prowess. And I, I got to think there's so many generational implications to that. And, and I know Harvard <laughs> Business Review, I just saw yesterday is like going to do a massive study on this. Yeah. Which I'm so excited <laughs> to see. So the generational implications of of what specifically of just like Taylor Swift being the queen of America or yeah and just the ability to like raise up all things right because it's a different audience of what Swifties are versus NFL yeah. fans but the cross pollination of those generations of those demographics yeah. and you're right all all kind of well, the, I I can't comment on all of that and I am excited I think that Harper study is coming out. October 25th, if I'm right. So I'm, oh, wow. I think we're all kind of waiting to be like, what is this? But this is, this is what I can say is, and that I've done some writing on is Taylor Swift really being, um, I would kind of argue like the, the first artist who, uh, really figured out how to leverage social media, um, uh, in a way that helped create this like huge community and really blurring that line between social media persona and real life persona, even like with the eras tour, it, the fact that she paid such close attention to what her fans were talking about online and like the inside jokes that exist within the community of Taylor Swift fans. And then in real life at the performances, she would talk about those, um, those inside jokes. So like mother is mothering and Taylor hates evermore. And like, there were all these inside jokes that fans were having cool. on, on it online. And then she was bringing to real life and this kind of parasocial relationship that she has with fans. If we just look at like, why does the Taylor Swift fan base hold so much economic power? I think a lot of it goes back actually to this kind of interesting community build 
that she was able to create that started online and then kind of fused into real life behavior. So I think that's that generational component of it, of like the people who fall into that definitely being people who grew up in that, you know, with that idealistic version of social media that can create those meaningful in-person communities. But the whole thing. Of course you have a a really great answer. That's funny. My wife's like a hardcore Swifty and she is, if I give her like, I'm slightly curious about something tied to Taylor Swift. Well, her favorite number is 13. And this is what that means. And this is what we think is going to happen for the next (laughs) seven years as a result. (laughs) So ingrained, but you're right. It's so ingrained in, in those, that, that fanships is so cool. Yes. Yeah, it is. So I don't know if that was like the answer you were looking for, but I mean, the whole following the whole thing is just, it's so fun. And I think that people have been so hungry for just something fun. And like the whole TikTok prank about telling your boyfriend or husband (laughs) that Taylor Swift put Travis Kelsey on the map. Like that was the best thing that happened to the internet all year. And so I didn't fall for that one. My wife tried it the other day. (laughs) Although I live in Missouri. So I, I think she, she knows I know to Travis Kelsey is, so. Right, right, right. I just learned. I just learned like two Sundays ago. So that was, that was new for me. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, it's so funny. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, I could talk to you all day. Why don't we end with, um, for those viewing, you know, where can they find you? Um, any kind of plug for any of the work you're doing, uh, feel free. I write kids these days on Substack and that's kind of my baby, my little corner of the internet. Well, I'll put up essays and updates on new research. Um, any things that are coming out that are, you know, about generations or kind of generationally adjacent in the news or in um, academic journals, I'll always put them there and give some commentary and make sure that you guys have access to it. And so if you're nerdy and and in, into this, that would be a good place just to find the work and engage in conversation. Perfect. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks again. This was uh, super educational and I appreciate you spending the time with me. Thank you so much. This episode has been brought to you by Biz Library. Head to bizlibrary.com for more information.